Hello, everyone, and welcome to Camera Culture, a new video streaming series from Whale FM, putting the diverse creators of the NFT photography movement into focus. My guest today is Kurt Jurgen, a Canadian drone photographer who captures stunning character from the sky using unique perspective and technology to breathe life and narrative into the inanimate. Kurt, thanks so much for coming on and speaking with us today. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just to level set and ground everyone, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and walk us through your background in photography. Well, I'm a self-taught photographer. I've been doing this for many years now, I'd say going on maybe eight or 10 years. Uh, I haven't picked up the drone for that long. I've been basically just a regular kind of photographer, but I don't actually like work in the photography field at all. I'm a mechanical engineer as my full-time job. So um, photography has kind of always been a hobby for me. And as you can see, here's my Instagram. I've always been just kind of shooting whatever I see, shooting whatever I can find. And the last couple of years, I've actually been going very hard in the drone photography world. And I've been focusing on finding the most unique things that my area has to offer, um, just due to the fact that uh, COVID, we weren't really able to travel anywhere. So I had to find things in my own backyard. And that meant maybe driving like anywhere from one hour to like eight hours away to find something cool. So, um, and I was able to actually travel to Hawaii during this time, but travel during COVID has been one hell of a mission. So it's, it isn't worth it and it hasn't been too fun, but I think, um, what I've been doing with my drone and what I've been doing with my camera during COVID has been pretty, pretty professional and pretty outstanding. And um, I'm pretty proud of what I've been able to accomplish so far. Yeah, it definitely jumped out at me when you had shared some of your stuff on the server and uh, just, just a lot of the different components that pulled it all together. And I think uh, I love I love hearing that it comes from a different perspective, uh, being that you're a hobbyist, right? And you kind of picked it up, not as a profession, but just something that you did out of a creative passion. Um, did you have any formal education in photography or you just picked up a camera one day and ran with it? So uh, when I first started photography, it was with a GoPro. Um, I would take these ridiculous selfies with the really warped edges. And it was just kind of like hilarious because you would just think that there's this random dude running around like a field of snow throwing snow in the air with a gopro it's just like hilarious um but no i've never had any formal training i just kind of started taking photos and then my parents um, decided to get me a camera and then i started waking up and taking sunrise photos and just um trying to capture whatever i could and just kept taking more and more and more and then every time um like I would feel kind of stagnant. I would get some new tech. So the first thing I got was the GoPro. Second thing I got was my actual um, Sony camera. And then third thing was my first drone. And then back at that time, when I first got my first drone, like no one liked drone photography. This was like maybe like four years ago. And uh, I was still Instagramming pretty hard at that time. So I think at that point I had like 20,000 followers. And uh, most people are just like, what the heck? Like what is this top-down photography stuff like they they hated it so uh it's funny now like uh maybe a couple of years later i picked up the drone again and uh posted some photos and everyone was like whoa because now drones are more common so i guess they're a little more used to it but yeah i've never had any formal training i just kind of like keep shooting and keep editing and eventually like you can see my aesthetic like i have a pretty distinct style like i like to center frame things and find whatever cool subject i can find and and if i don't like it i don't post it pretty much so yeah you definitely have a uh, a unique aesthetic you know when i started looking at your stuff i could pick out your pictures when you would post it in some of the uh some of the chat rooms just by you know a brief glimpse because it was you know very synonymous with with what you've kind of built as character for your works how has that evolved since you started because when i look back and 
by the way, 32,000 on Instagram is pretty impressive for a hobbyist. When I look back at the beginning, you know, your photography was very different. How did this evolve to, to where you're at now? Because not only do you have that perspective from the top down and the drones, but I feel like there's a lot more contrast. There's a lot more, uh, you know, distinguishable lines and, and maybe more, I don't know, planning as to the, you know, the imagery and whatnot. I just feel like there's a bit of an evolution that happened here. I'd love to hear your take on how that occurred. Well, I think uh, when I first started taking photos, it was on my phone and I would also edit on my phone. So it was kind of like the app called uh, Snapseed where you would basically just toss a photo in there, crop it and change some of the colors and stuff. But then um, pretty much right when I started picking up my drone again, I got Lightroom, I got Photoshop. I pretty much got all the tools you could need, even the video editing software, it's all from Adobe. And from then on, like I really focused on my framing and I tried to spend as much time like fixing the colors, fixing everything just to make it look as um, appealing as I could get out of whatever stock I had. Uh, you should hit the little arrow on that one. It spells a fun word. Excellent. Was this your, was your, your handiwork out in the, uh, the yard or? Uh, well, it's a bit of a a composite but uh it's it was definitely an idea i wanted to do uh personally but i never got the chance to because i was gonna go do it one day at a one of these yellow fields in my area and uh they just cut the grass that day so i was cheesed and i took a photo of it anyways and i just made it work so it was kind of funny but it was really poor timing so i went with it anyways but everyone on instagram loved it they yeah, thought it was de hilarious. <laughs> definitely um and you know there's a lot of questions with regards to you know how can people kind of get some virality and get some attention and kind of parlay that into the nft space so i'd love to circle back around on that at some point but so you know you you get more advanced tech you get more editing software and kind of understand where you know your artistic vision is going to take you um are you creating in any other mediums or strictly photography? That's your thing. I really prefer photography, but recently through NFTs, I've been getting into making GIFs. And uh, I think uh, you used one of them for the stream, um, basically background. And if you were to like hop into my gallery, you would see that uh, I have a lot of animated kind of pieces there. Um, there are more things I want to incorporate into NFTs, um, being like 3D models, things like that. Being an engineer, I would like to start showcasing that side as well. But I'm trying to figure out how to bridge the gap between 3D and photography because I don't want to just make a 3D model and uh, mint it for no reason. Like I want it to be my style and within um, like you wouldn't like I want it to be kind of cohesive together. Like so. Yeah, uh, there's things I'm trying to do. Uh, videos, I can make videos. I just don't really like to. And they take so long that I just don't really want to pursue anything with them. And uh, every time I go shooting anyways, I always forget to take videos. I, I always have to go back a second time to take a video of whatever I was shooting. So it's just kind of funny. Yeah, I definitely had seen some of the cool um, kind of gifts that you had put together where I didn't expect, uh, I think one of the planes was shooting or something of that nature, right? You got yeah. the, the, car, the car circle around the plane. And uh, when we get into your specific collections, love to highlight those also. How would you characterize your photography style and aesthetic that you've kind of come to now? Because I think it's very distinct. Um, I don't know what category it would really fall un under. I just know I like to have everything centered. I, I rarely have things uh, like rule of thirds or anything like that. Those are pretty much the only two things I know of photography. I just really like having a subject in the center and then having kind of the background be um, whatever kind of thing it is. And like that one bird shot, that was probably one of my favorite photos. Like, I just like having things aligned, centered, and make sure that all the geometry and lines are clean and uh, perpendicular to the frame. Because uh, being an engineer, if something looks off, it, it just really bugs me. So I try and even warp the pictures a little bit if I have to, just to keep all the lines perpendicular and straight. So I'm kind of meticulous like that. 
Very cool. And then, you know, I, I feel like that you do a lot of um, adding character and adding narrative a little bit to your pieces. Uh, I feel like I look at things that, you know, without the lens that you're putting on it, I, I wouldn't have the same emotive response. Is that something that you've always done or is that something that you've cultivated over time with your artistic kind of experimentation? I think um, every piece that I create and actually want to mint and actually want to post somewhere, it has to feel something to me, like whether it's through the caption or um, just kind of like it's experience, like what it looks like or um, what the subject is. Like I want it to kind of speak for itself because normally I'm not uh, the most social or outgoing or talkative person. So I try to let my art speak for itself and uh, like, now with Twitter, like a lot of people are like, oh, you have to be on uh, spaces 24 seven. And like, I have a full-time job, like I can't always hop in there. So I try and let my art speak for itself for the most part. And like on Instagram, everyone seemed to be pretty, pretty pumped about my um, artwork, but uh, except the algorithm, the algorithm obviously hates me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, if if uh, if it was all based on the art, I feel like I'd be doing even, even better than I am right now. So, <laughs> yeah, the spaces thing is interesting. People ask me when do you pop into spaces. It's it's when I'm driving from A to B because that's the only time I have this actually connect my phone and listen to something. Right. Other than that, I'm not um, doing much where I could be that uh, involved in a conversation. So I do yeah. try to hop in occasionally, but it is challenging. It um, is. But, but I like that you, you know, you given these pieces of voice that speak even when you are not. Um, and it definitely called to me when I had seen it. And so I'm thankful that you were responsive and receptive to coming on to talk with everybody about yeah, it. There's a lot of planning. There's, there's more than just capturing something and saying, hey, this is great. These are planned. These have narrative. These have a lot of um, uh, editing afterwards to make them really show what you wanted to depict. What's this creative process like for you from like, inspiration to the time of execution and minting like it seems like this would be something that takes quite some time well um before i got into nfts like i was um on instagram going like really hard so i ended up planning my grid with content i captured probably maybe like i don't know maybe thousands of images and uh i planned probably about a year a year and a half in advance of what my grid would be for that year and the next year. So uh, just the amount of volume that I was able to capture, I was able to plan everything and kind of categorize how I wanted my Instagram year to flow out. And obviously like throughout the year, I would collect more photos, I would make more photos, and then it would move things in the grid. But um, yeah, so that mentality from Instagram started to come over into my NFT space and being the fact that I had all these photos already and I kind of shoot similar objects or similar subjects most of the time, I already had a bunch of collections ready to pretty much go, um, except for like marketing material um, and maybe some final shots here and there like uh, some of my more recent collections, which you're actually going through right now, these ones are pretty much in the works, but they are coming out in January. And I'm gonna be doing a little bit of a different approach than just minting a collection. I'm gonna just mint a couple pieces and kind of uh, upload as they sell kind of thing. And, but other than that, like I've had all this content for a long time and I'm just, ready for Twitter and ready for the NFT world to see it because it's not new to the Instagram people that follow me, but it's new to everyone who doesn't know me yet. So I'm just here slowly unloading all these uh, guns I have in my back pocket. Well, it sounds like you got a lot of ammo uh, based on the methodology that you would use for Insta because it was certainly effective. How did you find your way into crypto and into the, the NFT art space? So I actually found my way into crypto a couple years ago. Uh, one of my friends in school introduced me to basically Coinbase and uh, NF or uh, not NFTs, just uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all that stuff. But then it crashed. So I was like, oh, shit, like all the money I put in there is just like worthless. And 
stupid me. Like if I just kept adding to it, I would be like a multimillionaire right now. But uh, I'm here again. And uh, through Instagram actually is where I found NFTs because a, a couple of the drone photographers that I follow from uh, the States were posting about uh, NFTs and how they were selling them. And I was like, the fuck's an NFT? Like I, I had to ask. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, it's like a uh, internet Pokemon card. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I can make those. They're just like, yeah, I just upload my photos and then uh, whoever likes them buys them. I'm like, sweet, okay. So I started to get into that. Um, I think my the first thing I wanted to get onto was foundation and I, basically messaged everyone I know that's into NFTs. I was like, do you have an invite? And uh, fortunately for me, one of my friends from uh, university actually had one. So I was like, oh, thank God, like I got on. And then it took me probably like a month on Foundation to realize I should probably be on OpenSea too because uh, Foundation minting prices was a bit steep for me and uh, still is so i try and uh, put my best work up there and then mint on OpenSea for basically the majority of the collections because i have like i said a lot of content that uh it would just be a shame to wait till i could afford to mint them all on foundation yeah and you know it's it's personal preference but i think that's a great way to divvy it up i know a lot of people struggle with you know where to put their stuff and you know how to partition things when there's the scarcity conversation that happens and i think i've seen a lot of people successfully say that hey where i do some more larger series or gamification and things with the metadata and things of that nature open is a good platform for that because mm -hmm. the tools for searching and for you know collecting allow a lot of uh mechanisms that can you know tie into that whereas foundation is kind of highlighting right i, I think uh the ui is really good for photography there i think it's it's great for highlighting some of your premier pieces so i like that approach that you took there i was just looking through this giant monsters as we talk and it was you know it's super impressive um it pulls on a few different things for me so i find it interesting it's you know uh, my geek flag flies right when I'm trying to look at this and, and make an association with monsters. You're giving it narrative from the description and the title. Um, there's some distinct variety amongst them. Um, I love that you took something that was inanimate and just were able to kind of characterize it almost too perfectly in some of these. Quite honestly, I have no idea how you would have how you would have uh, prospected some of these. But I think you're you know you're doing a lot of things here, right? So you're you're numbering the collection. You're adding serial uh, serials. There's obviously messing with the metadata and giving some different attributes to it. Mm -hmm. Talk me through what you were doing here and the experimentation because I like it. But uh, I'm just I just want to hear your thought process. Okay, so. Um Right from the description, at least I have um, I have the number, I have its title, and then I also have a serial number. Serial number is obvious, uh, just minting order. Um, and then where it comes into play is I have properties and uh, the levels there. The properties basically give it like a geotag GPS, which is unlockable and the unlockable content, and then also the altitude of the drone. And then as for the levels. You can, um, it basically, it's more of a personal thing than it is for any, like it's not gonna make sense to pretty much anyone, but uh, it's basically what I had to do to get this shot. And a lot of them are based off of like Fallout where you have the attributes that you can kind of like add points to throughout the game. And um, in Fallout, you have basically all of these characteristics. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I should probably add this to my photos for some reason. And I just kind of went with it. And now it's stuck on all my OpenSea photos. So um, yeah, as, a, as a person who collected things throughout my life, including my childhood, right, I would get a, an action figure and have like a, you know, a skills card on the back and tell me what their whatever their strength versus their magic and all these different things and to mm -hmm. kind of call to that, but actually having a real application as far as how challenging it was for you to, to get it and all of that stuff. It add, just adds so much more character. And I feel like the process, at least for me as a collector of getting involved with NFTs and making a purchase or, or even contemplating it is it's, it's a, a very experiential thing. It's not so much. I want just, you know, the NFT itself. It's not so much. I want just the amazing photography or piece of art. It's that I want to take part and, and be a part of, 
the artist's vision, the photographer's vision, and what that experience is. And this just enriches that, this type of thing. And I'm not saying that everybody should do it, but the reason why the application of it has some appeal is because of that. Now, I don't mm -hmm. think that everyone needs it. And I'm sure you have collections where you just kind of go kind of dry, right? And you're just saying, hey, here's the aesthetic. Um, but I love that you experimented with this and we're really thinking about it in different ways. Well, I definitely wanted to keep it going. And I've been using it pretty much in all my OpenSea. Um, I always think uh, the strength one is one of the ones that uh, I lack because a lot of the times it doesn't take much for me to get the shot because I would just throw the drone in the air. I don't have to like go on an eight hour hike or anything like that. But there are a couple of them that I will be minting where I did have to go on these long hikes to get to these spots. And then that's where different attributes will come into play. But uh, for the most part, I think the charisma one and the luck are probably one of the ones that I have to deal with the most because I always have to convince my fiance to go let me take this photo. Uh, <laughs> and then also sometimes I get lucky. So I, I find something while I'm in the air and that's normally one, some of my favorite photos when I accidentally stumble upon one, like those water giants right there that was something I was just flying around scouting out. And I found that while I was in the air and I was like, wow, okay, this is cool. So a, a lot of things when I stumble upon it, I'm pretty excited about. So that's why I like to kind of put it all together and just bring the best out of it as I can. Yeah. Uh, impressive stuff. I'd love for you to just touch on, the collections and and did you try to differentiate these and different types of experimentation or you know was this all just part of your grid that hey i'm going to do it like this and chop it up this way um you know touch on your different collections here and what your thought processes were so um in the beginning i started with the um, the grass cutting one the fuck it collection uh, I thought that would be probably the funniest way to enter the NFT space. And that would be my gen genesis on OpenSea. Um, I just thought like my personality is kind of like, I'm kind of like a goofball, a smart ass kind of person. So uh, I thought it would just be funny to start with this and um, go from there. But I realized that right from the bat that people don't just throw money at your NFTs. You have to like work hard to get them to sell and, so I started with that one and then I was like, okay, well, I, maybe I should post some uh, better photos. And pretty much up into uh, the Giant Monsters collection, I didn't really know what I was doing. Like I minted the Fuck It collection, I minted Cloud Surfer, and then I minted the Boats, Boats, Boats collection. Um, you know, Cloud Surfer one was kind of one of those... Um, one of my favorite moment, moments while droning because um, flying through the fog is kind of scary because you can't see where you're going. You don't know if you're going to be able to clear the clouds. Um, but when you do, it's like pretty breathtaking. And um, it's still probably by far one of my favorite moments uh, in my photography career is actually seeing that come to life through like your uh, screen on your drone. So um, it, it was one of the more meaningful collections to me, but um, I, I unfortunately only got one sale because I didn't do a drop party. I didn't really do any marketing. I just kind of threw it out there for kind of for me, but uh, it didn't really pick up with the community. Uh, after that, my boats collection, I managed to get a couple sales in that. And this is probably when I started to make connections with some collectors like this was one of one of the first pieces I sold on OpenSea was from this collection. It was a couple kayakers in uh, basically this cool water. You should see at the bottom there. Yeah, those those three. So I sold two of those in two days, and then the last one I sold a bit later. But um, this is when I finally started to realize that like collectors are out there because at this point I was kind of like getting down. But this collection I totally rushed, and I probably shouldn't have minted it. Uh, right away because I was like I just want to keep minting like I'm just too too amped about NFTs I want to get as much content in there as I can and uh, I didn't really think too much I just kind of like threw it out there I was like just go for it but uh, I probably should have taken my time with this one and from then on I took a lot more time so Giant Monsters was after that and um, 
like I said before, like I would always find cool things while I was flying around and scouting out Google Maps. And um, it came to me that I should create kind of a, an animal, kind of monster-like kind of collection just because I had all these unique animals that I found, like the seahorse, like um, the little fish and the frozen one, and then this kind of aqua giant and the rock giant kind of thing. So I wanted to kind of group them together and I thought having them as giant monsters because they're huge. Like that, that raven is massive. And it was like some guy's uh, property in Quebec and he just carved this out of a swamp by, by himself and he made a park out of it. Like you can go there and you can visit and you pay a fee. And fortunately for me, like he spoke English and let me fly my drone there because I showed up on his property and he started yelling at me in French. So <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, really, really awkward. <laughs> but then, you, and then I was like, oh, I'm just an Instagrammer. I found this on Google Maps. He's like, oh, you can see it from satellite. I'm like, yeah, it's big. It's huge. So uh, it, it was just kind of like a funny moment. Uh, but I really, really like the piece because of that, because it's just a cool spot. And uh, I'm just surprised that someone put in the effort to do this. And he actually did it with a drone, too, which is even more like special to me. So, wow. yeah, I don't know how he managed to do it, but he did it. So. And then after this one, what what comes next? Oh, Lost Plains. Lost Plains was probably one of my favorite collections. Oh, I also forgot my dinosaur collection. Yeah. After my fucking collection, I made the Rossum collection. Uh, me and my friend took uh, his uh, dinosaur suit out for a little day and took some photos of it. And it's kind of been like a little trademark, uh, kind of like an Easter egg kind of thing that I do. So I try and incorporate this dinosaur into my other collections now. Uh, which showed up in my Lost Plains. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to put it in my next three collections, but uh, it will definitely make an appearance again. I just have to convince them with some beer and McDonald's or something. So, <laughs> the 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 moving fee of all my friends as well. Yeah, exactly. So as long as uh, as long as he's fed and uh, can get a little buzz, he does not mind taking some photos with me. Uh, but after that, uh, Lost Plains, that took a long time to make, and uh, it's probably my uh, hardest working and most proudest collection and will continue to be that because it's not easy to find planes and they're not easy to get. And it's just kind of like this huge overwhelming challenge to find all of these planes and to go there and capture them because they're not close and they're not advertised either. So it makes it a huge challenge. What I'd, what I'd love to do is, um, is set the table a little bit. You have that video kind sure. of uh, highlighting the collection. I'd love to run that. But before I do, do you want to give a, an introduction on what, what the collection is? Okay. So this collection is about uh, basically when I started Instagramming, I got inspired by a couple of people who had found planes in their backyard. And they were all international, so I couldn't do that. I couldn't get there. So I spent probably about six months trying to find planes with whatever resources I had. Uh, fortunately for me, I was able to find uh, a list provided by the Canadian government that basically mentioned where you could find abandoned airfields, abandoned airfields, uh, anything that involved airplanes at some point in time. And going there through satellite view, you could actually stumble upon a couple of planes. So I marked my map and I basically went out on these quests all over Ontario to get these plane photos. And it turned out extremely well. I managed to collect a hell of a lot of planes and uh, it just I just kept going. Like there were such unique subjects and no one knew how to find them but me, at least at the time. And I'm pretty sure like even if you go through all the drone photographers that I follow, at least the Canadian ones have no clue how to find any of these planes and they're all in their backyard, which is ironic. So they just don't, don't know where to look, <laughs> but it's, it's been, it's been probably like two years looking through satellite view to try and find all of them and just putting it all together was one hell of a challenge, but it was a lot of fun. I, yeah, I, I saw that you put uh, two years of scouting, 
um, 2000 kilometers of driving or something ridiculous, yeah. right? Like, yeah. so definitely a lot that went into it. When I saw the photos, it really drew me in because it was emotive. I almost had an emotive response to what was, you know, an airplane that was grounded. Different responses to different ones. I want to show everybody, but first, I'd love to play the video clip that you had put together. So let me run that real quick. Yeah, I spent a long time on that video. When I first saw that, and that, I saw that actually after I saw your photos and I was impressed, I was ready to run through a brick wall. I'm like, this is incredible. I got to learn more about uh, this collection, mm -hmm. this photographer, and this process here. Yeah, that I really wanted the video. So for this collection, I made kind of like a teaser trailer to start, which was also kind of cinematic like that. Uh, but didn't give away too much. And then for that, I really wanted to have uh, a song and kind of like a vibe of like these planes that just been kind of like abandoned all over the place. And I think r really the song really tied it together as best as it possibly could. Yeah, I, I felt like, um, you know, there was different points where you you leverage the dramatic flair or the drops in the music to like, hey, this plane like has almost been villainized, right? Like this is a, a one to watch out for or this is the carnage that happened because of something else going on. And then you see like, at, by the time I get to the end, I'm like, this is a, a bunch of bodies strewn across the, the field here, right? This is this is the embodiment of uh, carnage and, and, and war or something, right? So it gave it a lot of character and emotive response. Responses. And when you look at your photographs, um, they also carry that varied kind of perspective because not all of them are that dramatic and have that kind of flair. Some of them are more playful. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was I was really, really um, drawn in by that that entire collection and the way you put it together. Thanks. I'm so glad. It's uh, it was a lot of fun to make this one. Uh, but I like how you mentioned that uh, there are all these bodies in the carnage. That place... I got to say where I got that uh, kind of that wreckage was so sketchy that I didn't even want to stay there. It just, I just got the creepiest vibes. Like there was like these weird chickens running around and like there's these animals like making all these grunting noises in the woods. And then there was gunshots in the background because there was hunters around. So it was just kind of like the sketchiest like farm area and in like deep woods in the middle of nowhere. So I was like, I have to get these photos before um, like I get shot or <laughs> one of these animals in the woods attack me. So it's right, like someone in the community said, uh, you know, it makes you curious about the story behind every plane carcass. And that's exactly it. And not all of them are carcasses, right? Some of them end up in places you're like, why is this plane here? And what's happening? This doesn't look natural, but indeed it is. It's where it ended up retiring or, or being put to work. Um, so yeah, incre incredible stuff. Yeah, I really wish I could find out the history, but uh, a lot of the times I was getting in and getting out within a couple minutes. So I would uh, probably not uh, be able to ask whoever owns the plane or wherever it was. Either I would get in, in trouble, so I would just leave. So um, yeah, I just no idea what happened to any of these planes, but I kind of like um, when people create their own narratives for them. So and kind of let let them figure out what they want to believe happened to these planes because uh, I wish I knew, but I wasn't going to ask. So, 
Right. And and someone else I was talking to about this collection, they said they liked it because the character of each picture is different. And, you know, that means to them, there were certain ones that called to them, right? Like that's that's my plane that I would want, right? That's that's yeah. the one that I would choose, almost like you would with a, uh, you know, a, an action figure, a, a toy, a PFP, even, right? Where you're trying to find something that you identify with and want to signal. What is it? Is it power? Is it solitude? Is it you know, quirkiness? So to be able to take that and instill that into still photography of, uh, you know. Uh, an object that's been out of commission for some time. I just, I've been trying to wrap my head around it for some time. And I just think it's, it's super impressive from an artistic um, vantage point, how you were able to incorporate all those different things. And um, it just really made me appreciate, you know, what you do for your work. Thank you. Really appreciate that. But I didn't really do a lot of work other than trying to find them. Um, unfortunately for me, a lot of them were laid out wherever they were and, they were kind of isolated already. So it made it really easy to take these dramatic um, solo photos of these objects because uh, they were always in like an open area. They weren't like hidden. Uh, I found, I did find a couple that uh, were just kind of surrounded by too much shit. And I was like, ah, well, I don't, they didn't make the cut, but uh, all the ones here, I'm pretty proud of them. And the days, or at least the events leading up to capturing each one, like, there was probably like weeks or months in between of them because uh, it's just so far to drive in between. And it's just like, I have a job, so I can't just go and capture all these planes and then just be like, all right, back to work again. So it, it took a while. It really did take a while to find all of them and go there. So. And how has the response been to this collection? Because I feel like it's really a culmination of a lot of different things that you were, you know, experimenting right. with and doing. So on Instagram, people freak the fuck out because uh, everyone just thinks planes are the most epic ob objects ever for at least for drone photographers. Um, here, it's my best seller collection so far. Uh, I assume it's gonna do better in the future too. I'm hoping this stream does a little bit, um, but yeah, it's, it's by far one of my favorite collections. It will always be one of my favorite collections. And uh, ironically enough, I found an even better way to find planes right after I minted this collection. So I will be probably adding some more pieces to it in the future, but uh, they're far, like they're in different provinces, different countries. Like I went through uh, the States and I found probably about like 45 more planes. So I'm like, just a matter of time before I can go travel and go around. But uh, it takes a lot of time going to all these places. So, and they're so far, far and right. few between. So it's just fun, fun work. And it's uh, cool to find all these places because they're really unique compared to other drone photography sites. Well, in part a labor of love. And I think it comes through and, you know, the passion that, you know, you can see in the photograph. I love this tweet of yours and, you just said, I'm going to continue to do this. I've said since day one, this is something I love to do. And um, uh, I think you had another follow-up comment, something to the effect of, um, yeah, the scarcity paradigm is a problem because I'm a machine or something, something <laughs> of that nature, right? Like you just love creating and you, you're you going to keep creating. Well, I've been, I've been doing this, like I said, as a hobby since I started. So uh, it's never been about like making any kind of income because I've never really seen any income other than from NFTs. Like I've been taking photos since uh, I think in that post, I said 2014 and I haven't seen a single sale in any of my photos ever up until NFTs. And so like I've been creating this whole time without the idea of making money off my photos. It's just the fact that I like taking photos and it, like it's relaxing to me and it's enjoyable and it gives me kind of like a purpose outside of like work and life because you need a break from everything in life. And this is one of the best ways I find to relax is to throw my drone in the air and find something cool. So definitely. Uh, and then I also noticed that, you know, you have a, uh, uh, a piece that you had collected yourself as your profile pick. Do you find yourself kind of embedding more into the NFT community and collecting or have you already been there or where are you in that regard? So that PFP I actually got as a gift from one of my followers. Um, I have already been collecting 
NFTs. So I've been trying to pick up um, like drone photography from my friends that I came with Instagram because uh, before I started, there were like probably like maybe a couple drone photographers that I knew here already. And then when I came in, I brought in probably about six more into the community and like some have been doing well, some have been doing uh, worse. And um, but one of like one of them who uh, basically wanted me to get started from the start uh, is killing it. So like it it's just kind of like I've been embedding myself as best I can. But obviously, uh, financially, I can't just keep buying NFTs. I have to wait till I get some more sales. But uh, I've picked up eight pieces and then I've been gifted two. So I've been collecting as best I can. Yeah, and not even, and that's not meant to be a gauge on, hey, are you reinvesting or, or how, you know, how much are you putting in? I just think it helps tremendously when people can understand the culture of NFTs and the ecosystem because they participate in it in some degree, whether that's free mints or, you know what I mean, or, or they're active or they're a fan of X, Y, and Z. I think it helps. I think a lot of times people are, you know, coming from the periphery and they have a hard time understanding some of the nuances and you, obviously get it because you're 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 doing some different things with with your metadata with your descriptions with the way that you're putting collections together that tell me this is someone that is active uh and and understands some of the nuance of the culture yeah well i wanted to fully immerse myself into nft space and i definitely want to keep going like it's been it's been good to me so far and i want to continue like um just because like uh, I started minting and I started taking photos now doesn't mean I'm going to stop. Like, like I said in that tweet, like I'm not stopping creating because I don't have like sell out collections. Like I don't really care to be honest. I'm just going to keep making stuff because I'm just excited about my work and I'm excited to share it. And if someone wants to pick it up, great. If they don't, whatever, like it, it really doesn't matter. Like uh, most, most people that I talk to already have like full-time jobs, but uh, there are the couple that actually do depend off art and do depend off NFT sales. But fortunately for me, like I, uh, I have a job, like I, um, I work full-time and like I've been able to do pretty much everything I need to do with that income. And so any income I get from NFTs is just kind of like a bonus. Thank you. Like uh, appreciation for my art kind of thing. Like I'm not, I'm not going to die tomorrow or not be able to eat this week. So like, I'm just really grateful to be here and be able to participate in like blockchain and have my art on the blockchain and just, yeah, it's just exciting times. So. Right. Immortalized right now. It's on a whole different uh, place to be encapsulated and, and exactly. kept. I love to hear your perspective on some of the, um, you know, the flurry of activity over the past month or two with the photography scene and NFTs, you know, what, you, you mentioned onboarding or coming on board with a bunch of drone photographers at the same time. Was that a segment that was kind of lagging behind a little bit and getting involved just recently? Or, or was that something that has already been there and was just trying to onboard more people? So I think um, maybe just the drone photographers I know, like no one really knew about NFTs up until um, like I started, but uh, that's obviously not true because people have drone photography out there even before I got there, but uh, it didn't seem to be as apparent. And at least the drone photographers I know from Instagram, like some of the bigger names that I follow um, weren't there yet. So some of them are there now and some of them are still coming in, but there's so many artists that I know that need to get into NFTs and I've been trying to like push them. And occasionally I'll post like a couple of my sales on um, just my stories, just kind of like to reiterate the fact that whatever I'm doing is working and that they could pretty much do the same because like, uh, like I said, I'm not like a true photographer, like I don't have any training, but some of them do. And some of them have like fantastic photos that they should have minted that they should have on the blockchain. Like even if they don't sell, they should just have their work there as a permanent kind of thing for the future, just to like stay with the times and not get left behind. Because uh, some of the guys that I follow, they're like kind of older and a little bit. So they're kind of like, what's crypto? Like what's this? And they're the guys that are kind of like into, into crypto or know about it are like, 
just dove headfirst into NFTs. They're like, yeah, like we need to get into this and we need to be here for all of it. So um, every photographer that I talk to from Instagram, um, they kind of know that I'm here now. So they, cause like I kind of just took Twitter and just ran with it because Instagram changing their algorithms and stuff. Like I just don't want to participate in making TikToks. So um, yeah, then I said, uh, peace out for a little bit to all my Instagrammers. And I was like, okay, time to be on Twitter and time to try and make some NFTs and try and just grow within this community because I've already built one. I can do it again. Like it takes time and effort, but I can do it again. Like it is what it is. <laughs> right. Yeah. So what's your perspective on the flurry of activity over the past month or two where, you know, there's been a, a relatively big uptick, at least from our perspective on collector interests and, you know, media platforming. Obviously we're having this show right now. This is our, our second iteration of camera culture. Okay. Um, we leaned, we leaned in with the whale vault uh, over the past month. And uh, I think we put something like a million dollars into, you know, the NFT photography scene. And so um, that's after a, a whole different kind of level of activity prior, right? Mm -hmm. What, what has it been, you know, from your vantage point, um, what has it been like over the past couple of months? Well, it seems to me, at least it's been picking up uh, more and more uh, collectors have been showing up in a way, like a lot of the guys that I talk to or girls, I'm, to be honest, I don't really know anymore who's who, but uh, they uh, they come on and they're saying, like, I've been doing PFPs for a while, but everyone's like, photography is the next big thing. So it's kind of like uh, exciting to see that, uh, yeah, the whale community has been going hard. Like uh, Whale Shark has been buying <laughs> a lot of art and I've been watching them be like, wow. So um it's it's really exciting to just be in the moment and be here but i don't know what's going to happen like i feel like it's going to go either crazy like pfps or it's uh just kind of going to be like a couple photographers just like get elevated to like god level so it's kind of uh interesting to see what what's going to happen and like to actually just be present in the moment and see how it how it all, all unfolds yeah i think what you're doing is important because you're doing some experimentation you know with with the photography and and how that resonates with the you know the ecosystem and the collector community because like you said just left as is you know you don't really know but you're trying to pull different levers and see you know what what people respond to so i think um I think it'll be interesting to see that evolution and the same kind of conversations happening in other mediums, right? And, and the written word and poetry uh, and music, you know, they have their whole, a whole different kind of um, value proposition question going on and they're getting some momentum as well right now. So very interesting to see what happens moving forward in 2022. I think one thing that's definitely going to help is just, it's become so ubiquitous now, right? Like I'm at the barber shop and the guy next to me is talking about, you know, having, uh, having NFTs. And so I think it's becoming more accepted and understood that that's kind of where you want to put your collecting efforts or, you know, where it could be more useful or fruitful or, or, or even just being able to, to show it and experience it in different ways. So I think that bodes well for photography moving forward, especially, especially as more and more people get the idea of having murals in their home and things like this, mm -hmm. where you can, you know, um, have that backlighting and really, really have a beautiful uh, showcase piece. You know, ima imagine some of your, I'm imagining some of your planes in my office right now. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to lead people too much to certain ones. Cause I don't want the ones that I like getting mm -hmm. scooped, but uh, <laughs> I, yeah, no, I definitely think, uh, I think definitely it'll be a good year going forward. Um, what are your thoughts on the, you know, there's a lot of discussion when this uptick happened from the community almost almost a little bit of a pushback saying hey we've been happy with where things were and uh, now i feel like there's collectors exerting influence or trying to say how we should do things or we need to add x y and z um and i tried to jump into some of these spaces and share our perspective from the community which is more along the lines of hey we're just sharing some macro nft culture stuff um, but there seemed to be a, a little bit of an undercurrent of we want to be able to to create that we want to the way we want to create we don't want to be um tied to gamification or having to do specific things to be successful 
So to answer that, uh, I haven't been around too much in the space. So I've been kind of avoiding some of those, um, those rooms and those chat rooms. Um, I would say like, yeah, there was a little bit of pushback. I've seen some artists that are kind of like upset about how things are going, but, um, I don't think it's going to be like, we're not going to have to like add games or anything like that to our artwork because we are at the end of the day, photographers and our artwork should be enough and it should speak for itself. Uh, I did have someone approach me and say that I should create kind of like this whole storyline behind um, my pieces and kind of make this like world where you like have all these background stories to everything. And I'm like, this sounds like your art. It's not mine. Like, I don't want to take you. I don't want to absorb your ideas because that's how you feel. I should have my content. Like, right. I like having, I like having my art speak for itself and whatever, whatever you think is good enough for me, as long as it comes, like brings up a conversation or like some kind of discussion and it makes you feel any kind of emotion. Like that's my goal at the end of the day. Like I, I go for two things in my photography and mine is like, I want you to laugh your ass off with uh, like the dinosaur and the fuck it. Or I want you to be like, holy shit, where the fuck did he find this? Like, it's just, that's what I go for when I take photography. Like I just want people to be shocked and or i just want them to laugh like that's just where my uh personality comes through in my photography yeah and it it definitely does um i try to avoid some of those conversations as well because you know i, I think that we're just trying to spread positivity and um and provide uh you know context when people ask for it but you know at the end of the day everything's subjective right i want mm -hmm. people to create the way that they want to create um and it's it's interesting the value for me in a lot of art that i like to consume whether it's nfts or even oh, my barber even a tattoo artist a chef is their creative process right so whenever anyone asks me hey would you want me to do x y and z i'm that annoying person that says no you do whatever you think <laughs> and that's that's what i'm going to love i'd pay a premium for that because for me it's the process it's the creative vision of the person behind it that's a value to me that i want to be part of not so much the end result so mm -hmm. I, I love that perspective that that you have as well um a couple questions here i got from the audience i would love to run by you if you have a few more minutes before we let you go um, someone asked, you know, what are your thoughts on the uh, AR and VR capabilities and how that could be used with photography? Have you put any thought behind that? So I have been in uh, Decentraland recently. I just kind of hop in occasionally for fun. I like the fact that you can have like a gallery in there. So like you can go on a little walk with your friends and show up into like a gallery and see some pieces there. So I think that's pretty damn cool. And then, like I said before, um, I also wanted to start creating some 3D pieces to go into my on cyber gallery and kind of, I don't know why some of them aren't loading, but they, all right. <laughs> Anyways, like I love the aspect of going into a gallery and walking around and uh, kind of just looking at some art. And then for like AR, I don't really know like, how much it will come into play for like my art. Because like when you look at like your phone and you see an object that's kind of portrayed on your desk with your phone, you're like, eh, all right, like it's kind of cool. But I'd rather be like immersed in like the goggles and walk around and actually be able to see things in like, like Decentraland or I haven't tried Sandbox yet, but I want to do pretty much the same thing there walk around, have fun and see what you can do. Cause uh, I don't know if you ever spent some time in there, but it's kind of fun. Like, it's a cool experience. I definitely have it. I tell people all the time, it's a game changer. You know, you can obviously go in in your web browser and check it out, and it's cool. But when you do it with the goggles, it's a whole nother experience. I, uh, I haven't I have, tried that yet. But I, I I have, to... Yeah, no. So if, you, if you've enjoyed it thus far, that will blow your mind. Um, I have a little guy and, uh, you know, we try to do movie night or whatever. I try to get him to watch the matrixes leading up to this one. Cause you know, I said, nice. let me revisit it. This is some classic stuff you should check out. And he was like, ah, I'm not interested. He, he really had, 
he had no interest. And then via the stuff that I do, we had a discussion at one point about what the metaverse was, X, Y, and Z. So um, he had seen on the web browser and clicked around for like five minutes and went to do something else. So one day he asked me if he could wear my Oculus and see what I was doing. And I was in there doing some stuff in one of our galleries. It blew the kid's mind. Then all of a sudden, we were watching Matrix, Ready Player One. He's talking to me about the metaverse all the time because it's experientially, it is it is so different yeah. to be able to move and see that you know 360 degrees around you. Yeah, no, I I definitely want to pick up a set just for that, just so I can walk around and be like, wow, this is like absolutely insane. Because at at that point, like that place is limitless. Like um, having my engineering background and having the ability to make 3D models and things like that. I would love to be creating things for that. But like I said, I have to find the bridge between my photography and that. So that way I can do that properly because I don't want to half-ass it and I don't want to half-ass. Um, I, I just don't want it to be shit. So I, I'm going to have to spend some time and that's probably going to be one of the things I work on this year. Well, we'll definitely look forward to seeing that, seeing what you've done just with uh, photography. I can only imagine what you would do uh, in the metaverse. Um, speaking of which, you know, you had minted some pieces just recently. What are some of the upcoming projects that you have on deck that you could talk about for 2022 that we can look forward to? So actually, pretty much I'm coming in with a bang right off the bat. Um, so I'm starting with three new collections. One of them is Fallen World, which you just had open. The next one is Maze Jump or Maze Hacker and then Small Islands. So I kind of want to basically bulldoze my way through into 2022. And by doing so, I'm picking some of the my next coolest collections and uh, finding the, like abandoned planes and stuff. They're always in like abandoned places. So I always had like... Uh, kind of a knack for finding abandoned things and finding cool beauty and random structures and things like that. And then like small islands is just kind of like one of those playful kind of uh, collections where you can like have your own island, you can uh, go visit it. Everything that I ever made comes with the GPS tag. So like if you're ever in the area, you can be like, I own this, um, even if it's not actually yours, but <laughs> you can, you can say you like have a photo of it that you own and it's just kind of one of those fun ones that you can play with. So I've been minting a couple pieces uh, here and there. I'm going to be launching another kind of trailer on the third. So three collections on the third, and then it's going to start from there. But I'm not minting the whole thing. I'm going to be doing like kind of a mint on demand option. So basically through DMs. And then I'm going to have like a surprise or kind of like an NFT lottery where you can just pay us like a little minting fee and then uh, you get a random piece from the collection. So that's what I'm going to be starting with in the, in the beginning of the year. And I'm hoping that one just uh, changes things a little bit, because like I said before, like the whole scarcity thing, I, I don't, I'm not a patient person and like I have all this art and backlog ready to go. And it's just not new to you guys. Like it's, it's right. not new to me. Like I've, I made this for a couple of years now. So it's like, I'm ready for my next stuff. And my next stuff is the, what I want to make for the metaverse. So here I am just like bulldozing my <laughs> photography into the space because it's ready. It's been ready and I'm not holding back. Yeah. And I, I think that's cool that, you know, you're continuing with that experimentation. Whereas here you have different tiers, right? You have like commons, rares, legendaries, things of that nature. Right. And so now you're adding a component of a uh, blind mint, right? People, uh, people can pay and get, you know, you can end up with the legendary versus, yeah. you know, a, a common. And then, you know, you have some attachments to that because it's what fate has brought you uh, in that realm. So I think that's super cool that you're continuing to do that. So on the third, you said new trailers. Yeah. New, new trailer. It's uh, I did a triple trailer. So it's one like massive video, but it has everything in one and I've run it by a couple of collectors so far. And they said it was like fire, like, lost planes but like on crack so should be good Oof, that's a high bar man <laughs> <laughs> that's a high bar right there lost planes on crack i like it yeah uh, so someone had asked uh what do you do for scouting any advice any specific apps so i use satellite view a lot on uh, google maps so basically it depends what i'm looking for like if i'm looking for um kind of like a maze or something cool then 
Google Maps isn't really going to help you. Uh, you actually have to just go straight to Google and start typing away at trying to find things. But occasionally when I'm like bored as shit, I'll just pick a random area and I'll uh, go to satellite view and I'll scroll around kind of like in a grid like pattern until I find something unique. I'll mark it and then I'll move on to the next area. So I spent a lot of time doing that, um, but it really depends what you want to find. And a lot of the times going to satellite view is a waste of time if you know what you want. So once you know your, what subject you want to find, then it's much easier. But if you're just going on a random spree, then go straight to satellite view and have some fun. You'll see some pretty cool shit, especially for drone photography. Okay. Very cool. Um, someone asked, this sounds very technical. Do you have any Lightroom presets that you can share with others? I unfortunately just lost all of my presets. Um, I did have a bunch kind of saved up and I ha actually was planning to recreate them today and tomorrow um, just because I have uh, an older computer and it was getting kind of sluggish. So I wiped it and then I forgot that my presets were all in Lightroom. So I kind of screwed the pooch on that one, but I will be recreating more and then I will have them already good good to go awesome someone uh made a comment i guess uh relative to the 3d discussion we were having maybe an interconnected drone swarm would work for 3d imaging for larger objects kind of like they used at the olympics recently yeah no that would definitely be cool i've seen a, a couple of my instagram followers do kind of like 3d modeling with um just a single drone I have to actually ask them how they did it because that would actually save me a lot of time in modeling, but it really depends on what file type comes out of that and um, what software I would need to use from there. Because if it's like a 3D printing file, I need a very specific software to work with. And uh, I used to have it at work and I probably won't have access to it now. So um, I can't, I'm trying to wrap my head around how that would be possible to control a swarm of drones like Dr. Robotnik from Sonic or something like uh, maybe it's more maybe it's it's less intensive than I'm thinking. But uh, what a question. It's actually like uh, I've seen it done. It's kind of like uh, they're all interconnected with like an Intel chip. So okay. you basically have like um, you since everything's uh, on GPS, you basically just set a different parameter for each one and then you can kind of have them flow. And they do a lot of like 3D kind of imaging and kind of thing at like events now because of that. Very cool. Uh, and someone asked, can you share what drone you currently use? So I have two um, photography drones and then one racing drone. Um, I use my Air 2, which is actually right beside me. So that's, that's my go-to now. Uh, but before that, I had a Phantom 4, and I only upgraded like a year and a half ago. Very cool. Someone uh, made a comment. They really like the approach that you have of taking a ton of volume and then parsing through it to curate it and seeing you know, what's happening, what, what you could use, and what's relevant um, for your collections. Someone asked, have any of the plane owners ever seen these pieces and reached out to you? Not yet. <laughs> And if they do, I don't know if they would be happy or impressed. So, right, we'll find out when they uh, when they find them. It's like but, a rever reverse of the blind mint. Now is the blind reaction. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. I know one one uh, place that I found the planes was uh, Airbnb. So the guy who owned the Airbnb just basically made these planes in his backyard. And um, I feel like he would be the only one who would be proud of them. Um, the other ones are mostly like in abandoned places. So, All right. We may have some top secret locales, right? That we weren't supposed to know that these uh, planes were down there or something. Yeah. So I might get in trouble with something maybe later. Who knows? Like maybe the feds will come find me. Like, I don't know. <laughs> what does that mean that it makes me want the NFT even more? I don't know. I have to <laughs> get myself evaluated for that. Someone asked, do you say, do you see yourself ever leaving your day job and doing art only and photography only if that was a possibility at some point? I would absolutely love to. Um, fortunately, uh, unfortunately for me now, I just got my first house and I have a huge mortgage that I have to pay. So 
I need the steady income, but at some point, if it doubles what I currently make or and is pretty consistent, I will definitely be considering it because um, I don't know about you, but when I go to work, I'd rather be doing photography or I'd rather be doing anything else than work. So I hear that. Uh, someone asked, I see that you're experimenting with GIFs. Do you feel that multimedia has an edge over static photography? I think at least in the VR gallery setting, uh, like when you walk into an on cyber, seeing something move is really like attention drawing to me at least. Like a lot of these pieces that I've created as photography like alone, they're cool. But then when something moves and you don't expect it to move, you're like, oh, oh, hello. Like <laughs> it's just kind of like a, a one up, I think. Right. And I noticed that you you um, provided that along with the base static image. So if someone said, hey, I love this, but I'd rather have it without the motion, I, that's there in some cases mm -hmm. where they could opt to do that as well. Yeah. So I, um, I'm i kind of like a little bit of a nerd and a geek. So um, I kind of made the animated ones a shiny version. And um, the regular static ones are just regular version, just like in a, like a Pokemon card where you could have a shiny Pokemon and things like that. Nice. Nice. So if someone selects the base one, we have to kind of shake our head and question their, uh, you know, their upbringing a little bit. They may have been deprived or skip Pokemon <laughs> altogether. Um, a couple comments from the community just saying, hey, good luck on realizing your dreams. Congrats on the house. I do have a very technical question. Someone said that that drone that you showed was pretty tiny. What camera attachments do you need in order to generate quality images? Are those raw files or regular JPEGs? So it spits out raw and JPEGs. Um, this one has, uh, I think, half inch sensor. I don't really know the specs off the top of my head, but all I really use on the front of it is just a polarizer, like nothing crazy. And the camera quality is already good enough. Like it's a regular DJI drone. Like it's, they're all pretty damn good for photography. Very cool. Uh, someone asked, what are some other photography uh artists that we should be aware of whether it's drone or not that you could shout out and also besides photography what are some nft projects or artists that you are into okay so drone photographers i will shout out a bunch of them because that's those are the people i came with and that's always been my community before i even started this so i will say the ones who are here are uh, timbo slice uh, benjamin harley sebastian which is sb drones and then there's your daily nature fix. And then there's uh, Bajarki Joe Hansen, I think. And then Nick Skies, uh, Kara, I forgot her handle, but there, there's a bunch. And if anyone wants to, they can DM me and I can send them a list. I have a lot of drone photography friends and I have a lot of photography friends from here as well. So feel free to reach out to me for that. And then what was the second part of the question? Sorry. They asked, uh, what are some non-photography NFT projects or artists that you're a fan of? So the guy who onboarded me from into, my, into Foundation, his uh, name is Lloyd. He's strictly 3D animations, and he makes these really cool pieces on Blender. And he's been a huge inspiration in this, in this space and kind of the reason I started in the first place. So him for sure. Excellent. Well, Kurt, thank you so much for spending some time. I'm sorry I kept you longer than I had promised. Uh, I know you have other things to do with your engineering and whatnot, far more important than me, but the community <laughs> definitely loved this interview. Appreciated you taking the time to share with us, you know, your creative process and um, everything that you're doing and the exciting stuff on deck for just a few days from now when we start 2022 with a bang. Yeah, exactly. Well, I really appreciate you having me on here for that. Uh, we will see you in the community and we will be on the lookout for that drop when it happens, my friend. Have a great one. Yeah, you too. Nice chatting. Thank you.